You're listening to The Score from Bering Drift with your host, Rick Sincere. Welcome back to The Score from Bering Drift. I'm your host, Rick Sincere. This week, we pick up where we left off last week with our conversation with two Young Voices contributors, Sam Peake and Rachel Tripp. We had a wide-ranging chat about immigration policy, tariffs, and President Trump's visit to Europe, among other things. Let's listen. We're just going to have a sort of a freewheeling discussion about what's going on in the world. And let's start with the threat of tariffs against Mexico to persuade the Mexicans to do something more on immigration. Uh, Sam, let's start with you. What, what, what's going on with that? Is, is, is it really going to happen? I don't know if it will or if it won't happen. Uh, the, uh, President Trump has made a lot of these same uh, threats before, and he's backed down on them, just like he did with closing the border. But if he does, it's going to be it's going to be really disastrous for both the U.S. and the Mexican economy, and it will likely exacerbate the migrant crisis. And th- there's some opposition to this proposal foaming up in Congress right now, especially on the Senate side. There, there may be some kind of resolution passed against it. Do you know anything about that? I think that there's a growing understanding that if we are to implement tariffs against Mexico in an attempt to help them, you know, force a decision around the border, really what it's going to be doing is punishing our own consumers and our own capitalists who are trying to turn a profit or consumers who are trying to purchase goods to uh, in a way that they can afford. I think that our legislators are recognizing that and hoping to push the president in a different direction. What has Mexico been doing with regard to the migrant crisis that is falling short? Are are they willfully not acting to prevent more migration from uh, Central America? Well, I think that there is probably an argument that can be made that Mexico can do more. They have cut a lot of funding to their own uh, to their own um, processing uh, agencies, but at the same time, though. The Trump administration expects them to absorb all of these asylum seekers, and the United States government can't even do that. And we have so much more resources than they do. And a tariff will close them off from resources. It will worsen the economy, and it will make it even harder for the Mexican government to to absorb these people. And uh, there was the announcement this week that the Trump administration is cutting funding for the children who are being held uh, in in detainment camps at the border. No more English lessons, no more uh, soccer playing, no more lawyers helping them. And, of course, there have been numerous instances of toddlers showing up at an immigration hearing with no legal assistance and having to defend themselves against government lawyers. Rachel, what do you think of that situation? Of course, there obviously has to always be an approach of compassion, particularly when it comes to minors. At the same time, I understand that there's an attempt here to encourage the Mexican government to take responsibility for what are essentially their own nationals. I think that ideally responsibility has to fall not only to the United States government to treat them humanely and keep them safe, well-housed, and fed while they're on our property or within our borders, but also on the Mexican government to recognize that there is a responsibility on their end to help bring them back to their own country of origin, since President Trump has made it very clear that he is not willing to absorb them here. And uh, there have been some proposals in Congress uh, to increase funding for immigration courts to help alleviate the backlog. Do you think there's any chance of uh, that legislation passing and getting to the president's desk uh, for his signature? Either one of you? Um, I'm, I'm not optimistic about it, given the gridlock in Congress right now, and I'm not optimistic that President Trump will sign it. Uh, but, you know, in spite of that, I would like to see a bipartisan push for that. We need it. We need a, a system that that exerts our values and recognizes the rights, the international right of, of asylum seekers to claim asylum. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, something that a lot of people are, are mixed up about. You know, some of them, some people think that these are just kids or families who are crossing the border illegally, but a lot of them are using the international standards to ask for asylum. Uh, there's a difference between the two categories, but uh, certainly with, as, as far as asylum seekers go, uh, we, we need to uh, respect international treaties. Isn't that true? 
I think that there is a challenging approach to this because there are so many people who are claiming asylum and many people who are claiming that they're also coming to the United States to seek a better life. Obviously, the United States was built on immigrants coming to seek a better life, but as we have evolved as a society, there have been laws that have been put in place to help them come into our country legally, help them join into our system of social security and taxation legally, and those who are seeking asylum, it's very hard to determine whether or not that is a legitimate claim. I think that coming from a country where it is not maybe as comfortable as the United States or there aren't as many economic opportunities does not necessarily qualify as a legitimate, recognizable claim to asylum. And, and when you think about it, a lot of these immigrants from Latin America, south of Mexico, even living in Mexico is an improvement for what they have. Mexico is a middle-income country, industrializing, and this is one of the problems with the tariffs because, you know, we've got the supply lines between Mexico and the United States and Canada and the automotive industry, for instance, that would be disrupted by adding import taxes to auto parts, for instance. So this is a comment that I've made on the record before, and it is that particularly when the caravan was moving up from Central America, South America, coming up through the continent, if they were genuinely seeking immediate physical safety or immediate reprieve from an overarching government or oppressive conditions, there were many opportunities for them to stop on their journey and find themselves, as you just mentioned, in a much safer, cleaner environment where they do have an opportunity to prosper. If the United States was their long-term goal, they also would even be an opportunity to find a short term work, find ways to come through the system legally, and by not doing so, they're proving that, at least in my mind, asylum is not their immediate claim or that personal safety is not their foremost goal. It's really to enter the United States, which I completely respect, but only if they're willing to do so legally. And if I understand the way asylum is supposed to work in the international system, uh, a refugee is supposed to ask for asylum in the first country that they reach in which they can find safety. Is that right, Sam? Uh, so... If you have say, uh, um, a safer country agreement with um, with the country, and we do not have that with Mexico because Mexico has not demonstrated that uh, that they're, they're not going to comply with the international law of non-refoulement, which means that you turn people away without processing their asylum claim first. Uh, we don't have agreement with them, and so that's why they are able to legally claim asylum in the United States. Uh, back to the point about people who are crossing between ports of uh, entry illegally. You can see that the Trump administration has exacerbated that uh, quite a bit. Uh, you have the the, um, the union chief of, uh, of border patrols claim as such, and you have uh, government. You, you have um, DHS interviews with people uh, with border patrol agents claiming as such too. It's the me it's metering where you uh, where you block where you're, where he's blocking people unnecessarily from uh, from entering through the ports legally. And what they're doing is they'll re, they'll, they'll re-enter three times or four times, and then they'll cross through in between ports, and then uh, they get prosecuted uh, as entering illegally. Is the Trump administration policy of threatening tariffs a way of pushing Mexico to honor some of these international agreements that already exist but they're not participating in to get uh, a treaty between the United States and Mexico uh, dealing with these issues? I know the Mexican foreign minister was in Washington, uh, I think today, talking to Vice President Pence. Is this something that's on their uh, uh, talking points? I'm not sure. I know that the, the problem with this is that if you're going to negotiate something, you have to make sure that you're willing to go through with that. And Trump has even proposed uh, extending the tariff to 25 uh, percent um, within the course of time. Yeah, I think October 1st would be the, the yeah. deadline for raising yeah. it to 25 percent. And, and, and the United States economy, especially in Rust Belt areas like Michigan, which 10 percent of their um, their imports rely on Mexican goods, uh, that's – it's uh, – it's going to devastate a lot of those areas. It's almost as if uh, President Trump is trying to scuttle NAFTA 2.0, the USMCA. Do, do you think he, he has something nefarious in mind? I think that President Trump is someone who prides himself on his ability to act as a businessman, make deals that he believes are profitable, and I think in this instance, make deals that are going to be beneficial in his mind to the United States. I think that he does have the good of the country in mind, not necessarily uh, some underhanded or nefarious agenda, but I do think, again, that the approach to tariffs or trying to force an agreement through tariffs, while also maybe having some of those diplomatic meetings like you just mentioned with Vice President Pence or whoever else, uh, is not necessarily the best way way to move forward since it's not really helping the immigrants in question or the American people. Let's uh, segue a bit. Uh, President Trump is on a diplomatic mission right now. He's overseas 
for the D-Day ceremonies. He had a state banquet with Queen Elizabeth in, in London. How, how do you assess uh, his, his visit to the UK, Ireland, and France? So considering, uh, going off of our discussion of diplomacy here, I think that any opportunity for us to have a positive and friendly interaction with our allies is always a good idea, always a positive move for international relations and diplomacy for the United States. Obviously, the, great, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and the United States have always had that special relationship. And I like to see this administration furthering that with the Queen, who obviously has also had her own opportunity to further that relationship with many presidents in the past. From what I've seen, this has been an overall very positive visit for both the United States and the UK, although obviously there have been the typical protests that we would expect uh, when a foreign leader visits any country. And just as an aside, uh, Queen Elizabeth is 93 years old. I've never seen a more vigorous <laughs> nonagenarian. I mean, she, when she speaks, she speaks with authority and grace, and uh, it, it's amazing. You, she's dealt with every president of the United States since Truman. <laughs> Uh, longer than most of us can ever even hope to live. There, there was another question I wanted to ask. There, there seems to be uh, some uh, confusion about U.S. policy towards Libya right now, and you know something about that. What can you tell us? So I think when it comes to the way that we treat our allies internationally, again, as I just mentioned, it's always very important that we maintain as many diplomatic relations as possible, but we have to put the safety of our own American people first. With the civil war that's happening in Libya, Libya obviously it's awful to see the violence that citizens are dealing with, civilians are dealing with a very challenging uh, coup, essentially, on a regime that for a long time has been in power. And when we consider whether or not the United States should interact with that war, should get involved, I really think that it's it's their civil war it's their it's their problem to deal with essentially and i would not like to see our own american troops being sent over into a situation of violence and danger when really the libyan regime and the libyan system of governance is not a threat to us as it stands or with the potential uh, gaining of power of this new regime as well yeah, there was a specific instance last month, or maybe it was in April, when uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued a statement in support of the Libyan government, uh, the, the, uh, the provisional government, I guess it is, yes. in Tripoli. And a couple of days later, President Trump had a phone conversation with a rebel leader, Haftar, uh, and essentially endorsed him. Is there a disconnect in U.S. foreign policy making? I think that there has been uh, several instances where Pompeo and President Trump may have viewed international relations or issues of foreign affairs differently. I think that we've seen that with the recent potential conflict in Iran as well, where Pompeo is much more willing to involve American troops in that conflict in Iran. And President Trump, I think, has said on the record many times that he wants to have a new approach to the Middle East that does not mirror the one that we've had in the past, which has been very interventionist, uh, very hawkish. And I don't believe that President Trump wants to further that tradition of involving our troops in conflicts that are not necessarily a threat to the, to the United States, a threat to our economy, and certainly not worth endangering our own uh, servicemen and women. Just to wrap things up, we've been talking about immigration, we've been talking about tariffs, foreign policy in general, but on the immigration issue, I'd like to get each of you to assess whether there will be some kind of, I won't call it comprehensive, but significant legislation dealing with immigration issues between now and the election in uh, November 2020. Sam, do you have any ideas about that? You know, with Trump, it's, uh, it's unpredictable, but I'm not optimistic that we're going to get the politically polarizing issues uh, like DACA through anytime soon. I think that if we're going to look at immigration form, reform, we have to see it through smaller parts of overall larger bills, you know, like uh, more legal protections for uh, people who served in the military, immigrants who served in the military, liberalizing health, you know, uh, foreign workers and in industries like health care. Uh, but I don't see an actual immigration reform bill actually passing. And Rachel, what do you think? I think that the answer might be a little bit different were we not heading into an election year. Uh, I think that this is an issue that the Democrats are certainly going to try to bring to light. They're going to make it a election year issue. But I don't believe, particularly with the gridlock that we've been seeing with this Congress and this administration, that there will be any particularly new or re revolutionary legislation passed this year. Uh, I would like to see our legislators taking a long, hard look at our immigration system and considering what a best solution is to protect our legal immigrants, our citizens, and also to ensure that there is a path for, again, law-abiding immigrants to come into this country and contribute to an economy that does rely on their contributions. 
Young Voices is a great organization, and I'm glad that you're participating in it. Are either of you working on articles that may be published in the next couple uh, weeks, regardless of what the topic is? I feel like I'm always working on something. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been following the Democratic 2020 candidates, and as, uh, as the news unfolds, so does my writing, recently published on uh, Mayor de Blasio's candidacy announcement in New York City. Uh, as an East Coaster, I'll be following all of the news from all of the candidates that are coming from the Northeast region, uh, and I will be sure to keep you updated as that goes on. And Sam, do you have anything coming up? Yeah, uh, I'm writing about um, about our need to bring in more uh, foreign healthcare workers to the United States. There's a uh, <laughs> There's a lot of bills in Congress right now that aren't getting enough coverage, and one is likely to pass, too. Okay. Well, that's an interesting topic. It's sort of a, a immigration issue in miniature, but it affects our whole health care system. Well, I'd like to thank you both for joining me today, and welcome to The Score. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you.